So um, first of all, thank you so much for joining us on our business model innovation um, series. So today we're kicking that off and um, that's going to be great. So my name is Mark Garner and I am from the Communities and Partnerships at the Design Sprint Academy. And today we just want to, before we get started, just to talk a little bit about the Design Sprint Academy and also um, about today's webinar. So at the Design Sprint Academy, we bring innovation to design sprint innovation to the world. And that's what we've been doing. We've been helping companies to build sustainable products, discover opportunities for innovation and solve their toughest business challenges. And we do that through a priority process called the Design Sprint 3.0. And we do that, we, we facilitate design sprints uh, focused on complex business challenges and we've been helping to de-risk big projects. We also, we train, we train people and help them to build and scale their own innovation capabilities by running things like design sprints, problem framing, other workshops. And we also provide all of the necessary tools and support in order for teams to be able to thrive. And we provide also certification in the Design Sprint 3.0 methodology. And we do that both in a theoretical and practical competencies. So now we're gonna just move on. And we also want, this is part of our sort of community of practice. And the Design Sprint Academy, we support um, a group of networks around the world. We also are part of Google's affiliate network. So we run chapters in London and Berlin, and we, it's great to see so many people joining from around the world. I think the community at the moment is over 5,000 people. So it's great to see so many of you here. Okay, so today we are here to talk about business model innovation because the world has changed. And so when your business is gonna survive, thrive or fail, it's really gonna depend on your ability to act and quickly and position yourself ahead of the competition. So a lot of us have had to really rethink our product offering right now. And for a lot though, I'm afraid this won't be enough. So we're also gonna to need to discover new markets and there are new audiences and value streams ahead of the competition. So how are we gonna do that? Well, this is what we're gonna start looking at in this business model innovation webinar series. And we're gonna kick that off today with an introduction to business model innovation. And also gonna look at how we cope with change. So we'll start by looking at how change makers can find new ways of working and implementing, well, implementing them productively. So let's have a quick look. So today we've got two great people speaking. We've got John Fatan, the CEO and co-founder of the Design Sprint Academy. So since 2016, he's been helping major brands to innovate and solve big business challenges with design sprints and problem framing. He has been training and working with brands like Google, Adidas, Red Bull, HSBC. And today he's gonna to give us an introduction to business model innovation. And the second speaker is Brie Groff from SY Partners. She is a transformational um, expert who has spent the last decade focused on innovation and organizational design. And she's worked with companies like Adobe, Dropbox, Capital One, Calvin and Klein. Now we saw Brie at last year's Google Sprint Conference and we were so blown away by her topic, coping with change. And that's probably more, yeah, more relevant than ever. So if you do have a question, um, please ask them in the Q&A on Zoom, and uh, we will try to get to as many of those questions as we can with the time we've got left after our presentation. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop this presentation and pass this Zoom call over to uh, John. So John, I'm gonna make you the host now. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Good to see so many of, uh, of you. A uh, short introduction to business model innovation, and I'm going to start with, with a question. Why business model innovation? And quite clearly, and I think for everyone, is that times have changed, and they did so very fast. And then in today's difficult and rapidly changing environment, we saw at Design Sprint Academy, our clients facing a series of challenges like never before. 
And I think it's very safe to assume that other companies are facing these challenges as well. And then at this point to address these challenges, running a design sprint to come up with a new product or maybe running a design sprint to improve a service is no longer enough, which is why we, uh, we were looking for a new approach. And before I uh, dive into what this approach is, um, I just want to quickly show you what are these challenges that we, uh, that we found. So what's so new about them? First of all, all of a sudden, nothing that worked yesterday works today. Now, actions that were guaranteed to lead to success, proven strategies, none of that works. Even being complacent or doing nothing used to work and now that's not the case anymore. Not only that, but customers have changed behavior. Granted, some of these behaviors will revert back to what they were, but some are here to stay. Good examples are, are how everybody embraced online shopping or virtual technology such as the one that we're using now. The question is, how will, how will organizations understand in the future what customers value, their new experiences and the new use cases? More, you know, as if it wasn't enough, there's new policies and regulations. There are health and safety regulations that now affect how businesses operate, how they interact with their customers, how they deliver their product and services. Like, Think about a business that maybe relied to uh, having a thousand people walk in their store every day. Today, they have to settle with much less in order to comply with social distancing rules. How sustainable is that? Finally, we don't, uh, we're not looking at too many challenges, making the right decisions, right? It's very easy to sail in smooth waters, but true captains, they show themselves during storms. But since the rules have changed, how do teams know to play the game? How they can make decisions in these adverse conditions where there's lots of uncertainty? So the question is, what framework should they use to make these decisions? With all that said, given all that, with so much change happening suddenly and on so many levels, it's very clear that the status quo has changed. So what's next? I think everyone's been hearing about challenging status quo. You know, uh, I think in every innovation project that I heard of, like status quo was almost like a mantra. We need to challenge the status quo, something that lots of people would preach, very few would do. And I, I guess that happened because nothing would happen, right? You would be perfectly fine just being complacent and not challenging the status quo. But now that's not the case anymore. And I can only see three choices for companies, for yourselves. First, you do nothing and you'll eventually fail. You adapt and survive. And then you will transform and strive. Not all of you, some. So yes, you can say that there are some lucky ones which are favored by this, by this situation. If we can call a pandemic a, pandemic a lucky context, but Look, you have Zoom, other video conferencing platforms thriving, home fitness platforms, e-commerce, home deliveries, you name it. But who can guarantee that they will be in the same position six months or 12 months from now? That said, I don't think everyone is lucky, you know, and you should not rely on a favorable context, you know, such as this one, which is not. It won't last forever anyway. And I would say that the capacity to survive and more than that to thrive is going to be predicated on your capability to adapt, change and act fast. Now to go beyond the survival mode, maybe you'll need to reinvent and reimagine your business model. And that's something that that's why we at Design Sprint Academy, we created the business model innovation sprint. What is it? This is a facilitated process where we combine design sprints, problem framing, business modelings, and patterns of innovation to give you a strategy for innovation, to help you identify where and how to innovate in this new context, and very importantly, 
give, securing the executive buy-in. Good, almost there. Is this for you? The answer would be yes, if you wanna act with urgency, you know, and be one of the first to respond to these new challenges and also embrace the opportunities. Yes, if your leadership team will need the framework to make decisions, to de-risk the new ideas that they might have, and also to create a vision for the difficult times ahead. Yes, if you happen to have lots of innovation initiatives, there are lots of organizations that have a huge portfolio and you wanna see which of these still holds true and which are the most promising in this context. And finally, yes, if your current business model is no longer working and you have to explore a new one. So what can you expect? A few things. First of all, it's executive buy-in because no strategy will work without having top level support. And then you'll know where to innovate. You're going to have a very clear idea of what the best opportunities are. From new audiences to new markets, new financial models and beyond because one certain way to fail right now is to focus on your product alone, improving your offering. You need to go beyond that and do as many types of innovation as you can. And then once that's clear, there's going to be an action plan. What will you do next? And how will you measure that? What will be your key metrics to say, yes, this is something that we should try. This is something that we should execute. And then finally, which I feel it's very important, it's accountability because no plan will work without individual accountability. So who's going to do what? But all of this, changing a business model, all of this comes with loss and with resistance to change. And this is the question that we'll be looking at today, how to manage this process, how to cope with change, how we can move then towards new business models and new ways of working in a joyful and produ productive way. And I'm going to hand it over to Brie to speak more about this. Thank you. So I'm so excited to be here. I have been all over the world, given dozens and dozens of talks on organizational change and transformation and what it feels like to lead through it, to go through it. And every single time I change the title of my talk a little bit and it's based on the audience, it's based on the current context, um, the sort of the experience of the people uh, listening. And for this talk, I had a few false starts. I thought coping with change. And I think I was just feeling kind of down about this whole pandemic. Coping felt like the best I could do. Then I thought, no, that's quite depressing. Thriving through change, that's, that's what we want to do. Uh, and that felt a little bit overly optimistic. So where I landed, which feels most honest to me right now, um, I invite you to make your own conclusions, is just leading straight through the middle of change. Whether it's good or bad or ugly or beautiful, the fastest way to the other side of innovation is straight through the middle. So that's what we're gonna spend our time on. I recognize that many of you are calling in from all over the world. I have no idea what time of day it is. Um, if I give a talk in person, people come in and sit down and sort of center themselves. But I recognize that 15 minutes ago, you could have been putting kids to bed. Um, you could have been on another work call. Um, I, I don't know what your context is. So we just will take 60 seconds because I need it perhaps as, as much as anybody and just center ourselves and then we'll dive into the talk. So whatever day you are coming from, we are going to take 56 seconds, close your eyes, breathe in and breathe out and listen to some birds. Here we are. Possible that you are hearing birds. It's also possible that you're not hearing birds, which means that you are just perhaps watching me close my eyes for about 20 seconds. So um, hopefully that was relaxing as well. Um, wherever you are, if you could hear it or not hear it, I invite you to take a de deep breath in, a breath out. Um, and I am happy to share my deck after, in which case you can then hear the birds. So. 
Um, let's keep making sure it all works. Do you see a picture of a sloth and a picture of toffee? Tell me in the chat. Great, okay, so this is going well. I wanted to start uh, with two stories. What do sloths and toffee have to do with each other? Um, probably when my husband was in his preteens, he said something to his family or his parents that said, oh, I love sloths, they're so cute. And for some reason, um, his parents have got it in his head that sloths are his favorite animal. And we frequently, even though he is a grown man nearing 40, get presents from his parents that have sloths on them. It is stuck in their brain that Brad loves sloths. Um, I'm not sure, let me stop for a second here so you can see me. This is a dish towel we have with a sloth on it uh, that came from my mother-in-law. This is not to say um, an ill word about them. I have the most wonderful in-laws. Um, it is to say that something that was true um, decades ago somehow persists, this narrative. The toffee that I shared, um, this is a bit of English toffee here, is a story from my history. When I was probably around the same age, I think I was in high school, I got a box of toffee as a present and I told my parents, this is delicious, I love it. And for some reason, um, that stuck with my parents as Brie loves toffee, that's the thing. She loves it, that's her favorite food, her favorite dessert maybe, and so whenever my parents want to get me a treat, they send toffee. Now, equally, I'm very grateful that they want to think of me. And I find it interesting that neither my husband nor myself have really loved sloths or toffee for about 20 years now, but still this narrative persists. And so when I think about that, let me share my screen again. I wonder why is that true that some narratives are so sticky? And I think about that in the context of business, that what are your legacy narratives that no longer hold true? What are those things that you used to say um, either six months ago, a year ago, a decade ago, that feels true. We want to tell these stories because it helps us with a sense of agency. It helps us understand our business better. Um, but you have a sneaking suspicion that these are outdated beliefs. So things like our customers prefer or our strength is or, oh, we've never been good at. The right way to sell is it's more efficient if we, there's a whole long list ending with COVID will never change how we what are those narratives that a little sneaking suspicion, a little kernel in your brain is telling you, I actually think this story we're telling is outdated. So I like to call these your naked emperors. Uh, if you recall the story, the emperor has no clothes, whatever the title is of the children's book. Uh, I, you're welcome to, to read it on your own, but the, the moral of the story is the emperor believing he has these beautiful clothes on that you can only see if you are royal and special has convinced the whole village that they can see these clothes too. It turns out he's not wearing special clothes. He is in fact naked and it takes a young boy to stand up and say, excuse me, um, but I see your butt. Um, you are completely naked standing in front of me, Emperor, for the whole uh, narrative to come crashing down. And what I find in organizations, having consulted for a, a long time now, is that there are always these naked emperors lurking in people's businesses, and they threaten the future of the business because they keep you wed to the past. So my hope for my clients, for all of you, for your businesses, is that you don't sacrifice a beautiful future for ideas you hold of your business that are no longer true. So I'm gonna start talking about how you make change, but of course the first question is what change do we make? Uh, and certainly Design Sprint Academy can help you with that. Um, and hopefully you have an inkling of an idea in your head already. I think we need to change this. I think this idea that we used to hold is no longer true. I think this is the thing that we're going to have to change. Our customers no longer prefer this, even though we say that they do. So hold that idea in your head, and now we'll start to talk about the experience of change and how you lead yourself and others through it. 
So we'll start with a, an experiment. Uh, corks. I actually, I'm still not sure if you can see me, so I'm going to stop sharing just to make sure that you can see my face. Uh, a little experiment for you all. Here I have a natural cork, beautiful, and a synthetic cork, functional. Uh, based on what you know about these two corks, there's no right or wrong answers here, I promise. This is just an experiment to get us going. Which do you think is the better stopper for wine? Which one is better? So there's this natural cork here or the synthetic cork. Go ahead and put it in the chat. Ooh, lots of good debate. They do both work. That's accurate. Whichever works to keep my wine in the bottle. Depends on the purpose. Yes. Fantastic. Keep it coming. So I use this as an analogy, not because I'm a sommelier, to be sure, but because I have read up on my wine corks and learned a little bit about their histories and change in the wine industry. So legend has it that 17th century monk uh, Dom Perignon first used natural cork as a stopper for wine, and it's dominated the industry since. What happened is along the way, the wine industry started noticing cork taint, if your bottle has ever been tainted. Uh, it happens because there's a fungus present in your cork or transmitted through it, and it can ruin a bottle of wine. So just like any industry faced with a sizable challenge, they invest, uh, invested a bunch of money in research and development and out popped the synthetic cork. It is both cheaper and it's not susceptible to cork taint. So they thought, ah, oh, perhaps it's better. Now, um, what I would like you to do is um, think about which of these two corks you would use if you had your own winery. And I will lay out some pros and cons. The synthetic cork, cheaper, not susceptible to cork taint. Um, it is um, easy to produce, but of course not quite as beautiful. You may be wondering about the ta uh, tactile experience of your customers, um, what it means to uphold tradition uh, in which the wine industry is steeped. Um, this is actually, uh, the cork in, is environmentally friendly in that it sustains the cork uh, forest business. So the question for you is which would you choose? Yes, cork is more romantic. Thinking of the customer, it depends, natural. It depends on the context, yep. So what I love about these responses is that there's many of both. And what I always find to be true in organizations, and every time I do this experiment, it's been dozens of times now in all sorts of different countries around the world, there's always a mix. And I say, well, that is because there is many different responses to change as there are human beings in the world and in your industry and in your company. The synthetic cork is indeed the newer technology. This is what you would call an advancement, the future. And still, there is still something so attractive about the natural cork that's come before. This uh, picture, let me start sharing my screen again. Um, is of a jar of corks that my husband and I keep for special occasions, we write on them. And I consider myself a change junkie to the core. I always want the newer technology. And still, if someone told me that this jar of corks needed to be made out of synthetic, it would feel like just a real loss that there's something so beautiful, romantic, uh, comfortable about what I have done to date of a legacy that has brought me to today. So the experiment that we just did is meant to demonstrate that even when change seems obvious for all the reasons in the world, you have your synthetic cork that your CFO is very happy with you about, still there is beauty and function and value in what you have done to date. And when you start to make change in your organizations, 
you can consider yourself a synthetic cork purveyor. That's your job as a change maker to say, this is the new better thing. We need to evolve and advance. You will find the tension and the resistance come because there is still such beauty and comfort in what you have done before in the natural cork. I feel this tension really intimately when it comes to these corks. People uh, in your companies will feel it ever more intimately when it involves their jobs and their livelihoods, their sense of competence, um, and how they see themselves in the future of their company. So the question that I'm always asking myself and evolving my answer to is why is change hard? And what I realized along the way is that people are not actually resisting change. What they are resisting is loss. Now, there's an old saying uh, that the only people who like change are wet babies. Like only if you are wildly uncomfortable will you scream for something to be different. Now, for better or for worse, most people in organizations who receive a steady paycheck are a bit removed and immune to the existential crisis that most leaders are feeling in organizations. The leaders who see the balance sheets, the P&L, they know just how fragile the businesses actually are. And so for leaders that we work with, change can actually be a pretty easy sell. It feels like being visionary, it feels like moving the company into the future. Um, it's that executive sponsorship uh, that John was mentioning. Um, so in many ways, um, leaders like to feel like they see the future ahead of them. But many times for the rest of the organization, the rest of the C-suite included, change can feel specifically like loss because something that they used to have or something that they used to value is being taken away from them. So i actually, over all of the years of leading change initiatives and consulting on them and being a partner um, to many leaders, have mapped out six different kinds of, of loss that I've seen happen time and time again. And while resistance um, wears many, many masks, it can look like uh, someone asking you to slow down or we have to think about this or just pretending that the change doesn't exist, resistance can come in many different forms, asking you for more details, What's underneath that is one of these six feelings of loss. Uh, more or less, if you find more, do tell me. So the first one is a loss of control. Um, I'll go through these quickly so we can save a little bit of time for Q&A. Uh, if leaders, if employees, if anybody, your colleagues aren't invited into designing the future of the organization or of your team, then change is something that's happening to them and even if it's a good thing, that loss of control will still feel like a more salient negative emotion. We actually used to work with one leader who would say that she could not give uh, her people a $100 cash bonus without somebody complaining that it was paid in $20 in 20s and not 10s or before or after tax season, that there was no good she could do unless everybody had their fingers in it. And I'm sure you've all feel uh, it both perhaps experience this yourself, feeling like change is happening to you, or that other people um, have experienced when you tried to lead change. I know that I've experienced this many times. The second is a loss of pride. And I think it's a beautiful thing that people have pride in their work. Of course you would want that. I have lots of pride in mine. And yet there are times when change can make you feel like the pride you had is no longer valid. So uh, I was working with one organization and they brought us in as consultants to help with a particular function that was really in need of some innovation. And um, we were sitting down with our main client, the former head of that department who was being transitioned out and the new head of that department and our client opened with, oh, we're so glad you are here to help us because this department is a disaster. Now, you can imagine for that former head of the department, that was a real punch to the gut. And even if that's just you know, a bad day at the office for that person, still, it wasn't just that human there. It was an entire department of people who felt like 
their work wasn't valued or um, seen as competent by the rest of the organization. And so before we did any sort of innovation or change work, what we had to do is restore that sense of pride that any company that is in business today has done something right. And that something, whatever it is, is worth celebrating before moving on to, and here's what we have to change about it. The third is the loss of narrative. Uh, and so this is similar to the legacies, the, the naked emperors that we talked about. The narrative or the stories that we tell about our work, about our companies, um, even you know, over dinner with family and friends and someone says, oh, tell me about your work. And you tell, you spin a certain narrative of how it goes and why you do it. And sometimes change can take all of that away. Uh, we were working with a, another client in the marketing department um, back in the time they were moving from print to digital advertising. And the head of that advertising arm had told the story for so long that print was going to be king. She had invested in her print team, built them up from scratch. And in order to get on board with what she saw was the obvious future of digital coming into age, she actually had to unwrite her own narrative, the tale that she had been telling for so long, not to mention dismantling and remantling, if that's a word, uh, much of her team. Now, loss of time, this is perhaps the most obvious one and the hardest one to tackle. Uh, we are in the business of giving lots of advice to leaders and the bit of advice that leaders like the least is when we say for any amount of work that you are putting onto people's plates when it comes to innovation or change, you have to find some place to else um, in their set of responsibilities to take those things off of their plate. Otherwise, what you are asking them to do is choose between the change you want them to make and spending time with their family or friends or sleeping. And that is not a great uh, equation to be on the other side of. Um, a few more and then um, be happy to take your questions. Loss of competence um, is one that we see particularly when we are working uh, alongside any kind of innovation or um, new uh, reimagining of a business. We see this a lot too when it comes to digital things that for a long time, uh, people in those organizations felt like they knew how to do their jobs. And that is a fantastic feeling. I love that feeling. I like to feel like I wake up in the morning and have a sense of that I know what to do to do my job well. But many times innovation and change can take all of that away. And in fact, if you knew perfectly how to do something in, that's yet to be developed, it probably would not be that exciting. So let me jump out here. We'll do a quick poll. Um, what percentage of your time at work do you absolutely know what you are doing? You can put in the chat, is it 100% of the time? Is it 90, 80, 70, 60? You can go down to zero if you want. 90, 50, 25, maybe 70. I can see this is a, um, I'm afraid to say. <laughs> it's a very innovation-y crowd. 10%, I love these honest answers. We usually, this is a very, very scientific um, assessment here, but more or less when we ask this question, we don't like it to be any higher than 70. Um, if it's four, um, circumstances when you are trying to evolve what you are trying to do. If you have hit on a really amazing um, business model or there are times to put your head down, be an expert and just pr produce and make and drive, that's great. If you are in a moment when you need to reinvent or transform, there needs to be a space. You need to be working up to the edge of incompetence. Uh, it's a scary place, but also a really fun one. What happens though is that there are some people in organizations who really signed up for this, who love, if you put like 25%, perhaps you love being there, but there are many people in an organization where change is happening to them and they did not sign up 
for 25%. They are the kind of person who likes to be at 90%. And for them, a new innovation that threatens their sense of competence is one that they are naturally going to resist. And, fin oh, sorry. and finally, um, loss of familiarity. Uh, this is simply that humans for all of time have been trying to predict the future. This is why we have weather reports and opinion pieces on what will happen with different stock markets. Um, we certainly cannot prevent um, or predict a pandemic spread, although we do try. And that kind of inability to predict the future feels very much like a loss of familiarity. We are living through this acutely right now, perhaps some of us in different phases than others. Uh, and what this can feel like is even if there is a good change happening, this lo loss of familiarity can feel so destabilizing that people will start to question, am I in the right role or am I in the right organization? So what do you do about all of this? I've just highlighted lots of different kinds of loss, but of course we want to pull ourselves out of that loss at some point um, and into bright new futures. And what we do about this is we realize that change is, can happen in an instant. Change is a thing that happens. So like in life, it's a birth, the death, the marriage, these things happen, they have timestamps associated with them. Uh, even in organizations, there's a day that, an, say, a reorg is official, or the merger is approved, or the reorg takes shape. Transition, though, is a process, and that is the process that people, humans, move through to get from what used to be to what could be. So when we're talking with leaders about designing the future, can anyone guess where most of them want to start? What is the sexy circle here? The fun one. Yeah, what could be? That's the, that's the one with all of the, um, the innovation and the success and all of the curves, curves moving upwards for your revenue and profits and all of those. Uh, it's, it's such fun what could be. And I absolutely agree. Sorry, I'm popping in and out so I can see the chat. Um, I absolutely agree. And yet, what I have learned the hard way is that the majority of people and organizations first need to deal with what used to be. They need to process it and they need to honor it. That moving on to say the synthetic cork feels like you are taking away all the beauty of the natural cork that I find so valuable. And so the antidote to resistance is to move through each step in order to first honor what used to be. Um, there's such fun examples of this. Um, one of my clients holds a, um, like a dia celebration, like the Mexican Day of the Dead, and they celebrate uh, projects that they have killed. And it's just their way of saying, we tried it, it didn't work, and good for us for having lived through that and learned from it. Um, I also, I had another client, uh, they were going through a merger, we were supporting them with that process, and the company that was losing its name, it was adopting the other company's name, they named a star after that, um, the company that was going to be uh, retired, so that even though they were adopting a new name, they knew that the company that they had built and loved still existed in the universe. And uh, actually the most fun one uh, example of this is Ben and Jerry's has a graveyard of flavors that they no longer produce. I think it, it's, uh, there's a physical one in Vermont, but I believe there's also a digital site as well that I've seen uh, to say, you know what, that, um, you know, cayenne pepper, uh, popcorn, peanut butter, cherry, crunch just like didn't fly off the shelves like we thought it would, but I'm so glad that we were there. So first we honor. Then there's this fire in between where you address all of this loss that people are feeling. And I call this the fire in between for two reasons. One, because, um, uh, let me tell a quick story. Um, one of the clients, a recent client I was working with, 
was feeling like he would propose a new change and then would sort of back off and get a little bit scared when you actually got into the need of needing to make decisions um, and get other people on board. And somebody said to him, he told me about this feedback he had gotten. This woman said to him, you know what your problem is? You need to stay in the fire longer. And for him, it was completely unlocking. Like, that's it. I jump out of the fire anytime there's a hint of resistance or uh, a bit of wavering. And it feels like fire and you have to live in it. That is the, that is the skill of a change agent, to be able to live in that fire. And I also like the term fire because there is such possibility for igniting new things that it is, there is uh, chemistry in here to be had. And in that chemistry, that should lead you to the fun part, the part that we all enjoy, which is what could be. So um, I'm gonna pause here for now, actually before I officially close. Um, what I'd like to say is through all of this, mostly what I have learned is that change happens through stamina. It happens with great ideas, but more than great ideas, more than the great ideas, it happens with the will and bravery of the humans who are leading this change. And while I've outlined these three circles quite neatly here, this is not a one, like a linear process. In fact, in leading change, you and I will run laps around these three circles time and time and time again, um, from what used to be to what could be and the fire in between and where are we even. And just like running laps in real life, it is painful when you start, but when you build that muscle, it actually starts to feel like health. It starts to feel like being healthy. And when you build those muscles, those are the muscles that will keep you in business because you can reinvent your business model. You can reinvent your business and take you into the next 10, 20, 100 years. We'll dream big. So um, let me stop there and say one, um, please reach out after. Don't be a stranger. Um, you can follow SY Partners. This is my um, website and email and LinkedIn is a good place to be. And let me pause there and say, um, happy to take for whoever has time. Um, just a question or two, or you're welcome to reach out afterwards. And I promise I have no answers because there are no answers uh, when it comes to change, but I do have some pattern, pattern recognition having done this work for a long time and happy to share the best of mine. So thank you all. Thank you, I pretty, that was fantastic. That uh, was really amazing. Um, it's so good, even virtually, I think it was so funny that how well this worked because mm -hmm. I've seen, you live with the corks and that experience. So it was amazing to see this actually happening virtually. Um, <laughs> yeah, it works so well sometimes these virtual worlds. Sometimes the technology doesn't work so well. But there you go. Um, there are a couple of questions that I thought, there's one that given the pace of change required today, given the crisis, how do we take them? This is one of the things I was always thinking about. How do we take the time um, and also, what would be an appropriate amount of time? We're talking about grief here to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. um, how do we take the time to process? Yeah, how do we take the time, especially at the moment, seeing as we're under such pressure mm. to move to this new what if as quickly as possible? So, what I would say is, if I understand the question, but I'll, I'll share my point of view. We have to be gentle with ourselves because it is our bravery and our endurance that will um, keep any sort of change alive. Change is hard work. It feels like that Sisyphus rolling the ball up. If we as change agents need some time, if we really believe that our organizations need some time to process and go slowly, and actually I'm having this conversation live with one of my clients right now, that is okay as long as you are not losing the bravery and the vision of what could be and still moving in that direction. Sometimes uh, what I've seen is people wanting to move slower using, oh, there's a lot of change and so much happening as an excuse when really what's happening is they are losing heart, they are losing the vision, they are losing 
that spirit of innovation. It's a crawling back to a space of safety. And it's actually a form of resistance to say, oh, there's too much going on and we just can't, we can't upend people and it's just like too much and we need to go slower right now. I have also seen clients though, hold fast to that vision Mm -hmm. um, and just pace themselves a little bit more. And I think it's a very fine distinction because going slower is the symptom, which has two very different causes. One cause is bravery and empathy for what your company can um, digest and metabolize. And one is I feel scared. Can we just slow down? And so as long as you have leadership, as long as you and your colleagues um, are holding true to the vision of what you want and are making steps there. Um, then I think the companies who pace themselves, faster pacing is better, but still pace themselves are the ones um, that will win. It's mostly important to hold the vision. Okay. Yeah, no, I can, as I say, it seems like um, uh, the change is something that's happening right now whether we want it or not. What do you think are the greatest losses when, I mean, loss of control? I mean, people are losing on so many different levels. Do you need to deal with those specifically? Is there a way of approaching each one? Uh, uh, as it relates to the virus? Yeah. Um, people are experiencing a lot of loss, a lot of loss of familiarity, a lot of loss of control. Um, uh, a lot of loss of competence too. Like me, I'm fuddling around on like, oh, I'll make sure my video is on even on this. <laughs> um, so yes, I mean, I think the best thing that you can do when you sense that people are feeling that kind of loss is to see it in them. The very worst kind of loss is the lo kind of loss that is not seen. And I, um, the companies I think that have done this really well and the leaders that I've seen do this well are explicit about mirroring back to people their experience. I know that you are working with kids at home and that's probably near impossible. I know that maybe you live alone and you haven't seen people in two months and that feels incredibly lonely and stressful. Um, I know that we have a lot of change going on in our business right now. Here's why. Um, here's what we believe is possible. and I know just how hard that can be to live through. And so when in doubt, it's a good old, it's like a good um, old coaching technique is just to, when someone says, this is hard, I don't know, I'm feeling it, just mirror back to them what they are saying and help people feel heard. Uh, and I found that's half the battle in change because people will keep pushing and keep resisting and keep talking until they feel heard um, by leadership, by their colleagues, by their teammates. Okay, and that maybe I think we've got time for maybe just one more question. Sorry, uh, but maybe that leads in. It was I thought it was kind of interesting this one about maybe mirroring or how you deal with the naked emperor in the room <laughs> without offending them, the person who hasn't seen it. Sometimes there's a change maker. That's the issue. Yes, um, this is a life. This is a lifelong career question of mine, and I can share some strategies I've used. Um, I can tell you what doesn't work, and that's to tell somebody that they're wrong. <laughs> and people generally don't like that. Um, what works a bit better, and depending on the person, um, is offering up some, actually, I'll give you an analogy for, for this one. Um, I used to take tango classes, if you can all see me. The bad way to lead in tango is to push, if you are leading, is to push the person where you want them to go. People don't like this. It makes them fall over. Um, they don't want to dance with you anymore. The way that you get someone, if you're dancing with them, to move in the direction you want is you actually just like open up your body and open up space in front of them. And that's how your partner knows to move into the space because you've, you've created the sense of possibility for them. And then they go, you don't have to push at all. And I think the same philosophy is true with change that if you tell someone they're wrong or you push them or say, but look at this data, um, that can, for many people, there are some very um, self-aware leaders who can digest that and, and um, have a really good spirited debate about it. But for the ones that you sense will be resistant, I would instead open up the space in front of them, which looks like 
let me come to this meeting with a few prompts, um, some brainstorming, or let me come with three starting points for futures that I could see um, that are, that point out the naked emperor, but point it out in a way that creates possibility and doesn't focus on something that the business did wrong, that the leader did wrong, that um, we believe um, isn't true. And I would say the, the third thing is to the extent that you can um, come with some artifacts. So when I've worked with leaders before who just haven't, uh, for culture change projects, who just haven't believed that the culture was a little bit rough, a little bit toxic, coming with um, quotes or audio with people's permission to the leaders to show them firsthand um, is so much more effective than me saying, um, you have a culture problem, because who am I? But to come with um, little snippets, audio, visual, a quote, a, um, this could be of customers as well, um, and just put it out on, their, on the table and some snake together can be a more approachable way than saying, you're wrong, look at this stuff, but I've found this evidence, what shall we make of it? Um, and then you can come to um, some new conclusions together. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I am, let's see if I can do this. We're going to um, try and reclaim um, the host. Let's see if I can do that. Yeah. Um, but I think, I think you did an amazing uh, job of explaining this complex subject of actually how we can actually, yeah, deal with this transition. But it is so challenging right now, the fact that we have it happening so quickly. So yeah. um, let's see if I can do this. So I um, perhaps you can do. I don't know if you can do it from your. Oh, side there. do I need to do something? Yeah, I, I need to you, hand. Yeah, you can. Um, because. <laughs> oh gosh, this know, is really, like loss of competence at its finest. Um, indeed, it is, isn't it, Joss? So let me see. Let me see. I can do a reclaim the host. Let me see. So it's been oh, yes. fun. Okay. We'll wrap up now. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much. I'm going to start my video again. And um, it has been a brilliant. It, it was so funny because I wasn't sure how you could make this talk work. Um, but it might work so well in this virtual environment. And uh, we really are so happy that we managed to kick off thinking about change, thinking about how we can move forward in innovating business models and how we can, yeah, start that process because it is one of the toughest things that we're going to have to do in the coming time. So, um, if you are more, if you are interested in finding out more about that, let me see if we can get across there. We um, there is, I think we sent out a link to this, and uh, one second. So, we're sending out a link to um, our newsletter there, and you can find out more about it. And we will be doing more of these series. So, so there's the link up there. I think we sent it out in the chat. And it's been really good fun actually having a chance to talk with you.